Hi everyone, welcome to introductory Python tutorials with a focus on uh, image processing related tasks. Until now, in the last uh, few videos, we have been working on the topic of unit for semantic segmentation, and we've been loading the entire data set into the memory. Meaning if we have 1000 images, we are actually creating a NumPy array of 1000 images. And if each image is, let's say 256 by 256 by three, we have an input array of 1000 by 256 by 256 by three that goes into our model.fit. Nothing wrong with that as long as that data fits into your memory. What if you have 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 images that you plan on using for training? So that's the goal for today's tutorial to understand how we can load data directly from the drive because it doesn't fit the memory in batches. Like if our batch size is 16 or 32, how do we load 32 images and train the model? And we are going to focus on semantic segmentation. So we are going to talk about uh, using UNet. Why am I stressing on this? Because the way you structure your folders for regular classification task is different than how you structure your folders for semantic segmentation. Remember, in semantic segmentation, you want your images and masks to be all, all the time together. You cannot just mix and match your images and masks. You need your image and corresponding mask to be together. So for that, there is a trick. If you plan on using Keras's image data generator, what do I mean? We are going to use the image generator or data augmentation available in Keras to load images in batch. And I talked about that in the past, right? And if you go back to video number 103, you uh, can watch this data augmentation. And in fact, as part of that video, we talked about how you can actually take these images and flip them, rotate them, stretch them, and all that kind of stuff. You can still do that right now with your images that you're loading in batches, but the focus for now is to make sure we load images in batches, train the model, and then load the next batch and so on. Okay, so but the tool we are going to use is very similar, in fact, the, exactly the same tool that we used for data augmentation. So please do watch this video, otherwise uh, the one that I'm going to talk about can be a bit challenging for you to follow if you don't have that background. Now let's uh, uh, have a quick look at the folder structure because I just mentioned about the folder structure, by the way, when you're trying to uh, uh, generate this or when you're trying to load these images in batches, uh, if, you, if you already have the images as part of pandas data frame or as part of numpy array, you're just going to use uh, a flow. Okay, when you're fitting this, uh, again, you'll see the code in a minute, so uh, I'm, just, uh, I'm just giving you uh, initial information here. Now, if you want to load the data directly from the directory, the method that we're going to use within data generator is flow from directory. I'll talk about that in a second, but let's have a quick look at uh, the folder structure. Okay, again, flow from directory is how we are going to load the images. So for classification task, if you have a bunch of, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say cats and dogs and uh, so on, right? I mean, you are trying to classify these, then the folder structure would be, okay, you have a train folder. Within the train folder, you have cat folder or directory, and then you have a whole bunch of cat images. And then you have a dog, you know, directory, and then you have a whole bunch of dog images. And very similar, uh, you know, uh, to training, you'll have validation and then testing. So when you use flow from directory, when you use image data generator for classification, it looks at train and then identifies how many classes you have automatically. And then it knows that, hey, you have 10 classes. So I found, I don't know, 20,000 images belonging to 10 classes. That's exactly how that works. So to trick it for semantic segmentation, the folder structure needs to be uh, this way. So in your data folder, you have a folder called train images. Within train images, you have only single folder or directory. I keep using the term folder and directory interchangeably, depending on your operating system, you can relate to that, right? So within data directory, you have train images. Let's let's step it, uh, take a step back. Within my data directory, I have train images, train masks, validation images, validation masks, test images, test masks. If you look for classification, you have train and then you have multiple classes in here. So when you use image data generator, it looks at train and says, hey, you have so many classes, right? I mean, when you say this is my folder, this is your directory or folder. In my case, I'm going to only put a single directory right here called train. 
So I'm making the image data generator think that I only have one class and that one class is called train. Same with training masks. I have exactly the same name. You see train and train. So it's like the same uh, name. So there is like one class, that's it. And within that class, like within train, I have all my train images. Within this train folder for masks, I have all the masks. Please follow this. If it's confusing, make sure you understand this before proceeding. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, if you just use the regular uh, regular image data org, it's not going to work. Okay, this is how the folder structure needs to be. So train images, train masks, validation images, validation masks, and if you have separate test images and test masks, again, uh, additional directories for that. And for each of these, I have the same name. For train, I have train and train, both for images and masks, and for validation, val and val, and for testing, test and test. If you have this, then you're good to go. Now, let's talk about how to get to this in a minute. If you have a whole bunch of images in images folder, and if you have masks in the mask, how do we get to this step, step, right? So I'll talk about that in a second. So let's jump to the code and talk about it. Okay, so this is my Google Drive, and my starting point here is this. 128 uh, patches is the folder, the, the high-level directory name, and then in here I have images, and just probably, just the way you probably have it, right? And I have how many ever images? I think I have 1,600 images or so in here, okay? And similarly, I have a directory called masks and I have corresponding masks in here and all of them are labeled either image 0, 1, 2, 3, mask 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So from here, how do I get to the state where I would like to for reading this data directly from the drive? So I have a, uh, let's, let's look at this. I have a little script right here. Uh, that's not going to get you all the way there, but that's going to get you 90% there, and then you just need to manually rearrange folders. So I'll share this so you have this uh, uh, like a reference for you. So first of all, you can write your own code to split the folders into training and testing and validation, but uh, uh, this is a nice, uh, nice uh, library that can actually do that for you. So go ahead and pip install split folders. Again, it, whatever I'm showing you on uh, Google Drive is going to work even on your local Anaconda or whatever uh, IDE that you're going to use. So once I have the split folders, now here I'm just giving the input folder directory uh, path and output folder. My input in, input path is 128 patches, right? So this is my input path. And the output path, what did I say here? 128 pa patches for data org video 121. So let's go back. That's the directory I just created, uh, an empty directory with nothing, okay? Uh, and then this is how the uh, structure is. If you go here, uh, I already showed you in my drive. I have my drive and then I have uh, data and sandstone and 128 patches, right? So images and masks, that, that's what I'm showing here. And then let's go ahead and use the split folders that we just installed, right? In split, split folders dot ratio, I mean, there are two methods. You can use split folders dot ratio or split folders dot fixed. Fixed is okay. I just want 100 images here, one, uh, 20 images here, or something. Uh, ratio is you're just saying okay, I want 80% for testing, 20% for validation. That's pretty much it. So you just provide what the input folder is, what the output folder is, uh, or output directory is, and uh, just a random seed. So it just splits it in a uh, predictable way every time you want to split the same data set. And the ratio here, I'm giving it 0.8 and 0.2. By the way, you can also give a third one, right? So you can just say 0.1 and you can just change this to 0.1, in which case it says 80% for training, 10% uh, for validation, 10% for testing, okay? If you only give two, it's training and validation. That's it, okay? And that's it. And uh, when you run this, it is going to divide or copy your images. I'm not going to do it right now because it takes a while. It's going to copy your uh, data from here, images and masks, and it's going to put into a folder uh, directory that looks like this on your left hand side. It's going to say uh, under train, you have images and masks. Under validation, you have images and masks. And remember, our original data set got divided into 80% train and 20% val. And at this point, it's a manual task right now, right? I'm, at this point, I'm just saying, okay, uh, under um, I'll create a new directory called train images and move these images, all the images from here into 
that folder train. And then I create another uh, another. You can automate this if you want, but uh, it's it's easy to do things this in uh, manual way because I'm not repeating this over and over and over again. So and then I'm going to create another folder called train masks right there and then move all the images from masks here into the subdirectory called train. So basically I just follow this routine once I have all my data here. So the biggest point here is splitting your data into train and test and validation. Once you have that, just rename the folders and move them. That's exactly what I have done. So if I see uh, this folder right there, you see uh, I have train images, train masks, validation images, validation masks. And under train images, there's a folder called train with a whole bunch of images. Let's not open that. Under uh, train masks, there is another, uh, there is a folder called uh, train with all the masks. Under validation images, there's a folder called val. Under validation masks, there's a folder called val with all the masks. If you have the structure, you're all set. Then everything is easy. Okay, so it's again getting the data ready. So now once you have that, what do you do? How do you uh, work with the code right here? Okay, so it's saying I'm not using GPU yet. We will in a second, so let's ignore that message. Okay, uh, this part we have done it in the last couple of uh, tutorials. This is just our unit. Let's go ahead and run this. This is nothing but our uh, unit that we have defined, right? So we have a convolution block, encoder block and a decoder block. And we are going to build a unit by using the encoder and decoder blocks. That's it. And we have done this many times, so no point, nothing different here. Okay, and uh, let's import our OS and matplotlib. This is, again, standard libraries, right? Now down here, I'm going to define my training image directory is basically under train images. It's the train folder, right? My training mask directory is this one. So all I did here is, again, you probably know what I'm going to show you. All I did is just go to my uh, specific directories there. So under data, I have sandstone, and this is the one, 128 patches. And right here, again, I just copy the path yeah, for my train images. And I pasted the, that path right there, my train mask right here. Why? Because I want to look at the list of images. OK, what is the list of images? And then I'm going to sort the list. It's very important to do this. Otherwise, your images and masks may not line up. Well, on Windows, they may line up, but here they may not line up. So it, it doesn't hurt to do it. So I'm going to sort the list. Same with masks. I'm going to read the file names from uh, uh, the directory, and then I'm going to sort them. And then I'm looking how many or what is the length of that list. And then that's how many images I have. So when I run that, it's now going through the list of all the images and the masks, and it's going to print out how many images we have in the training folder right now. So in the training folder, I have 1280 images, 1,280. Okay, so now let's come down. And here I am generating a random number between zero to number of images minus one, like 1279. And I'm uh, randomly loading an image, you see, uh, from using OpenCV, randomly loading a mask and plotting them. Why am I doing this? To ensure that my images and masks are indeed lining up if I randomly load some image. Yeah. Again, this is a very important step that you have to uh, that you have to follow so that you're not wasting your time training on some data that doesn't even match up. So obviously things are matching up, so we are all good to go. So what's the next step? Now let's look at what the values, unique values in this mask are. Again, if you watched my last couple of tutorials, you know that in this mask, the unique values are one, two, three, four. So we have to change those to zero, one, two, three, and then to categorical because this is multi-class classification. If uh, what I just said, the last statement did not make any sense, don't continue this video. Go ahead and watch the two videos before this so you know exactly uh, what problem we are trying to solve. This is a multi-class classification problem and uh, where the labels in this mask have pixel values of uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4 instead of 0, 1, 2, 3. Why? That doesn't matter. Masks come in many, many ways. It's part of our role as image processing engineers or data engineers to make sure the data is in the right format before you go ahead and train your model. So that's exactly what we need to do. So let's go ahead and print out the unique values. You see the unique values in my mask are one, two, three, four. That tells me, okay, I need to take care of this uh, while I'm reading the images from the drive. Okay, and the next step. 
uh, for this specific image that we just loaded, we just loaded one image right here, right? For our mask. For this mask, how do I convert 1, 2, 3, 4 into 0, 1, 2, 3? Uh, you know, the pixel values. We did this in the last video anyhow, when we looked at uh, multi-class uh, segmentation. So here is uh, the process. We are going to use label encoder from scikit-learn preprocessing. We instantiated this label encoder, and then we looked at height and width of our mask. Why? Because we are going to uh, reshape our uh, array in a second. So this is important. Uh, the label encoder can be applied only to one dimensional vectors. So we are going to collapse our label encoder or, you know, that image, sorry, my uh, mask into one single vector and then apply my label encoder, not just fit it, but also fit and transform the existing data. And now I'm going to reshape that back to original image size. That's a few steps, but Hopefully it makes sense to you. So after that, let's go ahead and print our unique values. They are 0, 1, 2, 3. And this process works even if your labels are, I don't know, 0, 23, and 56, and 178, right? So the reason I'm including this step is to make sure uh, those of you who work with, uh, you know, any types of different types of masks, you know, this, this process is pretty uh, useful and standard, I should say. Okay, so now we know how to convert this into, so what basically what we're trying to do is as part of our data augmentation, we need to perform this task. And we just tested how to do it on one single mask. So we can apply that to our data augmentation process later on. Okay, now we are slowly getting there. So this is where we are defining our data generator, image generator. Normally, it's pretty straightforward. You just say, uh, okay, my arguments for my image data generator right there. My image data gen is image data generator with uh, my flip equals to true, uh, vertical flip equals to true, and rotation equals to something, and uh, you know uh, zoom equals to something, and so on. Again, I covered this in our uh, video 103, I believe. But in this case, we need to apply a couple of things. First, our images are all 8-bit, meaning their pixel values are 255. We need to divide those uh, pixel values. Also, if you want to apply uh, other some some uh, other operations to your images it can be a bit challenging to do it in this context so what we are going to do is define a separate function called preprocess data and we are going to preprocess our images and we're going to preprocess our masks and whatever you would like to do with your images this is the place to do and the generator all it's doing is giving us a batch of images that's it and what I'm going to define right now is once I have a batch of images, what do we do to those images so that they're ready for our deep learning? Yeah, I hope again, uh, slowly digest this. First of all, let's go ahead and define a random seed. So uh, so every time we run this, we get the same batches. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's very important because, especially for semantic segmentation, because you want the same batch of images and masks, the corresponding masks, right? So we put the same seed for our image generator. There you go, for my image generator and for mask generator, same seed. This is one, uh, the only way to ensure that there is a match between these two. That's why I have seed there. Batch size is pretty straightforward. How many images do you want in a given batch for training? Number of classes, since we are dealing with multi-class classification, our number of classes is four. Why am I defining it here? Because remember, for multi-class classification, you need to convert your, uh, your labels into categorical labels, yeah? So again, we covered this in the last couple of tutorials, so we need to convert those and that's why I need my number of classes. Okay, now with that information, let's come down. We just talked about converting them to categorical, so we need to import that. We also uh, want to uh, perform label encoder first because our labels are one, two, three, four and not zero, one, two, three, right? And then we convert to categorical, so we need these two. Then let's go ahead and pre-process our data by providing it images, masks, and number of classes information. So by taking the number of classes, it can convert my mask into categorical, and I'm providing images because I want to do something to the images. Okay, so first of all, let's take care of the image uh, as part of my pre-processing data, 
I'm just dividing this by 255. If you really want to apply min-max scalar or some other scalar or pre-process, if you are importing uh, some other pre-processing method, any of that, you can kind of uh, apply that right here. And then let's move on to the mask. And we know what to do with the mask. We just saw that earlier in our experiment right here. We need to first uh, define a label encoder, and then we need to define my mask shape and why NHWC, because by the time the data generator gives me the mask. My mask is in the shape of number of masks, like 16, because it's a batch size of 16 in this case, my height and width, and the number of channels in the mask, which is one in this case. Yeah, so this is how the data generator is going to provide me my mask output. So I'm getting these, so I can reshape it into that once the, uh, once the encoder part is done. Okay, so that's what uh, we are doing right here. And up to this point, hopefully we have already done that. And here, the last step is, okay, once I have the label encoded, I need to convert that to categorical. All of this, I'm doing this because I would like to uh, uh, rearrange my, uh, convert my mask into categorical. If you only do binary segmentation, binary semantic segmentation, you don't need to do any uh, conversion of your masks into categorical, right? So the binary, you're already there. So I don't need any of this. For binary, I just need this part. And in fact, dividing your image by 255, you can do that as part of your image data gen. Now you cannot do advanced other uh, functions, but this part, you can definitely do it. Okay, so, so far, we just defined our pre-processing data function. And what it returns is my image and mask processed. My image is processed by scaling it you know, to 255, by dividing this by 255. My mask is processed by uh, converting my input mask into a categorical mask. That's uh, required for multi-class uh, semantic segmentation. Now let's come down and use our image data generator. This is very straightforward, right? I mean, the data generator part, we have done it in video number 103, but just to repeat a couple of things, uh, I'm defining image data gen as image data generator with these arguments, right? Horizontal flip, vertical flip. Why am I not doing rotation, zoom, and other operations? I'm not doing that because uh, for images, it's okay. When I do that to my masks, when you do the rotation, any uh, uh, pixels in between, it's going to fill that with uh, some interpolated value. And we don't want that for our masks. For semantic segmentation, for the masks, we want to retain our original labels of 0, 1, 2, 3 that are converted into categorical. So when you do these operations, uh, then uh, that makes your life a bit uh, uh, difficult. Of course, you can, you can handle that as part of your post-processing, uh, pre-processing right there, but I, I recommend not to include any of that. For a horizontal flip and vertical flip, no issues. Okay, so I define my image and mask data generator. Now my image generator is my data gen, which tells it what to do while importing the images. Where are the images coming from? This is where flow from directory comes into picture. Which directory? My train image path. I already defined my training image path. And then class mode equals to none. This is very important. Okay, uh, if the class mode is one or two or three, then it's, it's, it's looking for those classes. Let's just say class mode is none and color mode is grayscale. That tells us that, okay, while reading the images, go ahead and read them in grayscale and not in color. You can read them in color and again, go while pre-processing, you can just convert them into grayscale, but why do that if you can just do this? Target size, 128, 128. If your uh, local directory, if you have uh, images of different sizes, in our case, we don't have that. We have all images 128, 128, but if you have different sizes uh, while importing, you can convert them. And I recommend for semantic segmentation to not do any of that. I mean, not uh, convert your images from one size to the other. Images are okay. Again, when you do that with masks, it messes things up. I'm just including this for the sake of completeness. Batch size equals to 16 in our case, right? We already defined our batch size up there as 16. And my seed, again, it's very important to keep the seed yeah, exactly the same. Now, whatever you have done here, I'm doing exactly the same down here for my mask generator. My images and masks need to be always matching. So don't do anything different on masks uh, compared to your images. Now I define a generator called train generator where I just put image and uh, mask together. That's it. So whenever I call my train generator, it's going to give me both images and masks. That's pretty much it. 
Now, for each of these images, image and masks, right? For each of these images and masks in the train generator, meaning if I run train generator once, I get 16 images and 16 masks. So for each of those 16 images and masks, pre-processed data, pre-processed images, masks, and number of classes and yield, yield is important, images and masks. So what this is doing is, once the generator is generating the batch of 16 images and masks, my images are 8-bit, my masks are also 8-bit. It's going to go back up here, pre-process data and supply images, masks and number of classes, and it's going to return image and mask. That's what we are going to get right there. So this is my generator. Okay, so let's, uh, let's uh, run this. And now let's go ahead and define our paths. These are basically the training image, training mask, validation image, validation mask path. And then I'm defining my training image generator and then uh, validation image generator, that's it. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, run that. So everything is ready. Now verify that it is giving you the right data. So the best way to verify that is what happens when you run your train image gen? What happens when you call that? When you call that, you're going to get a batch of images and masks, right? That's exactly what we want. Uh, train generator, uh, that's exactly what it's supposed to do. So go ahead and call it and dot next next underscore. This is going to give you images and masks in a single batch. So when I click on this, it's going to, you see it's, it says 1280 images belonging to one class is found. Found 1280 images belonging to one class. So it's telling me in images and masks, it found 1280 right there. Okay. And now that I have my X and Y, go ahead and look at the shape of your X and Y. You see my X, which is my images, Y is my masks. I have 16 images, 16 masks. Each image is 128, 128 by one. Y1, because these are all grayscale images. And then my masks are 128 and 128 by four. Why four? Because up to this point, it's 128 by 128, that's it. And then it goes up here and converts my images into categorical and I have four classes, right? I have four classes, so I should have four channels. Okay, so we know that everything is working fine and if you want, you can go ahead and plot some of those images right there. Uh, again, I'm plotting some random images or the first three images I would say and corresponding masks. Uh, it's, it's very useful and important, I should say, to check these quite often. Like, okay, anytime you do some operations, go ahead and plot them and make sure that everything is lining up. Obviously, things are lining up here, so we are happy. We are all set. The next part should be, I mean, you do exactly the same for validation if you want, like to generate XVAL and YVAL, just to see is things, are things uh, okay even with validation. So we have 320 images below uh, for validation, 320 masks, corresponding masks. It's going to plot a couple of them right here in a second. Everything is matching. We're going in a methodical way. Now uh, we are all set to train our model. We have done this many times. First of all, we need to figure out how many training images do we have? We know it's 1280. How many uh, validation images we have? I think it's 320, right? So 320 validation images. Why am I calling those? Because when you're using uh, generators, when you do model.fit, you actually provide something called steps per epoch. And typically steps per epoch is nothing but your number of training images divided by batch size. This is very logical because when you have steps per epoch, think of this as number of iterations. Remember, if you have 1000 images and if your batch size is 10, then uh, uh, to do one epoch, you have 100 iterations, meaning it loads 10 images at a time and then 10 images and then 10 images. To complete all your 1000 images, it takes 100 iterations. That's exactly what steps per epoch here is. My steps per epoch, how many iterations to do in an epoch, is basically my total training images divided by the batch size. And I'm putting two slashes because that returns an integer. That's it. Or you can just say int and then just single, single divided by. I'm doing the same thing for my validation steps. And then uh, image height, image width, and image channels. We need this. 
to build our uh, our unit and number of classes four. So let's go ahead and run this. And now let's go ahead and build the unit. So I'm building unit. Why? I mean, we just looked at this function. I'm just calling the first function that we created up there, building the unit. What does it need? Input shape and number of classes, right? To build our unit. So let's come back down. There you go. So building the unit with the input shape and number of classes equals to four, compile it using Atom Optimizer and categorical cross entropy. This is a multi-class classification or semantic segmentation. And then let's track the metrics accuracy. I already talked about the metrics for semantic segmentation in the last couple of videos. Uh, that intersection over union, I believe I done a video on that topic. Search this channel for IOU. I'll see if I can leave uh, the link to that. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, but for now, for training, accuracy metric is okay. So let's go ahead and build it. And we're almost there. I have already trained the model, so don't worry. I'm not going to waste your time. And then I am going to do model.fit train image gen. Train image gen is giving it both the images and masks. Validation uh, data is validation image gen. Right, we defined both of these earlier. Steps per epoch, you have to provide steps per epoch if you are using generator. And then validation steps is validation steps per epoch. And go ahead and run this. I have done that for 50 uh, epochs. Now, one thing I just thought of uh, that I should uh, probably mention to you is uh, steps per epoch validation. Yeah, uh, if you are working on older TensorFlow, uh, or you know, I believe uh, one point something. Now, right now, I'm working on the latest one, which is 2.4, I believe, uh, or two point something. Let me leave it there. Uh, in older ones, you used to do model dot fit generator. You don't need to do that in the latest one. Yeah, it's model dot fit. That's it. You don't need to do fit generator. I mean, you can type fit generator. I think it works, but it gives a message saying that, hey, this is depreciated. So just use model.fit. Just a quick note. Okay. So after 50 epochs, I think I got like 98% accuracy. I mean, which is fine. And I saved the model. And then here is how the training went. And uh, let's go ahead and load the model. I have already trained it, so I'm loading it right here. And I'm compiling, uh, not compiling it. Compile equals to false because I'm just using it to prediction for prediction and nothing else. And let's extract some images. Uh, remember, we defined our validation image generator. I'm just calling it and with our next right there, which means we saw this earlier. It gives me 16 images, 16 masks. I'm going to use those for my prediction. Again, we, we have done this in the last video, so I'm not going through every line here. So we are just predicting. And after the prediction, I got a uh, IOU or intersection over union of 92.7%. And if you break that down into each class, I got 93% for class one, 81 for class two, 98 for class three, and 97 for class four. Again, as I explained in the last video, 81% uh, for class two, because this is the tough one. This is the one that looks like class one, but with some texture. Class three is easy, class four and class one, they're all easy to segment. So finally, uh, we can plot a few of these uh, images, which uh, again, uh, once, once uh, you load the model, you can load your other images and go ahead and train it. So again, uh, test it. So we have done this, so I'm not uh, going to you know, put too much time in explaining this, but the key point here, the key lesson, if there's one takeaway is it is about how to structure your directories so that they are ready for data augmentation using Keras. Okay, and uh, I I have given that as part, like right there, so you can follow that, so you can have a uh, look at it. Once you have that, it's just using data augment, uh, image data augmentation, and then model dot fit. Then you're all set. Okay, I hope uh, you found this video to be useful. And in the next video, let's cover again, extend the knowledge that we're building on, uh, 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 on these uh, semantic segmentations. And in the next video, in fact, let us extend our 2D into 3D space. How do you perform 3D unit or 3D semantic segmentation on data sets that are multidimensional that are, that are 3D? So please stay tuned for that and subscribe to this channel so you're notified whenever that video gets uploaded. Thank you.